to. Can you can you hear me like this? Yeah. Would you prefer? Yeah. Brilliant. I've only got two hands here. Um, excellent. So yeah, thanks a lot, Danny, Patrick, Luke, for inviting me to talk. Uh, no pressure in terms of some of the best talks at the UX Camp, I'm sure. Um, this is usually a 30-minute talk, and I'm going to try and condense it into 10 minutes. So if I'm incoherent, it isn't my fault, it's timing. Right, I'm going to talk about the minimal of a product. As um, Patrick said, um, I'm a co-founder of a company called Spook Studio. We are a startup studio, and we work with entrepreneurs, early-stage entrepreneurs, usually pre-funding, uh, self-funded, to get their ideas off the ground. Um, we also run a thing called the Happy Startup School. Woo! And Thank you very much. We had a summer camp and we have a summer camp attendee here. That is, uh, Happy Startup School is basically taking what we know as an agency and trying to deliver that to a wider audience who can't afford our fees, but also trying to put in a bit of happiness in terms of why are you starting a business in the first place? So really aligning your personal ambitions and goals with what you want to do in terms of the business world. Um, now, uh, people come to us and they want products built and this is the standard thing that we always have a challenge that we have is they want cheap Fast and good and of course you can't get all three you have to pick two So you can either get good and cheap and it's going to take ages Or you can have cheap and fast and it's usually going to be rubbish We prefer to ask clients to ask for this service with it's good and fast, but it's going to cost a hell of a load of money um, So why is it important to be good and fast particularly in the startup world? If you're not, if you haven't launched, you're not learning. If you have, if you're not learning, you've lost. Basically, a startup is a is a tricky uh, situation to be in because what you need to do is get your product out there to make sure that the idea that you had in your head is, has actual value to the users you're trying to address. And the balance you're trying to, to achieve is quality of experience. So you want to make sure whatever you deliver is actually going to be a really good experience for people. You know, they're going to enjoy using it. Um, but you don't want to spend ages building that thing, or else you will uh, miss your opportunity and potentially over-engineer what you're trying to build. Or you launch early, which is essentially you're going to build something rubbish. And what you want to avoid is actually either uh, having a valuable business idea sort of hindered by a really rubbish design, or the opposite, you've got a really bad business idea, but you just made it look really beautiful. And both of those are wrong positions to be in. So you want to find that happy balance. Like I said before, a startup isn't really a business yet. It's really uh, this amorphous organization trying to find a sustainable business model. Until you find that sustainable business model, you've only got a limited runway to survive. So, uh, because of that, a lot of startups fail. And has anybody heard of this book, The Lean Startup? Yeah, yeah. so this was supposed to be the, the sort of silver bullet, the, the pill that would help all startups actually build businesses that actually can succeed. And it was all based on this idea of validated learning and creating these things called MVPs, minimal viable products. Things, the first thing that you can build that's gonna test your idea. And so it's the version of a new product that brings the maximum amount of validated learning, i.e. you have a hypothesis about what your product does and the problem it solves, and you have going to test to make sure that that isn't just something in your head that you just made up. Um, and if we take the cake analogy, this is your minimal viable product. It probably tastes nice, it's probably got the right texture, it's just not very good to look at. So um, you've got to think about when you're delivering something, you've got to have a minimum level of, sort of experience, user experience in there to actually make sure that the person who's using your product or service actually has some kind of enjoyment. So what we would look, like to think about is the minimal lovable product. And I'll talk to you about this in more detail. Uh, these 10 sort of points about how to build a minimal viable product, but it isn't just about building something that works, but also building something that engages. So, something like this, yeah, it isn't the big cake, but at least it's something that's manageable, it's actually something that has a bit of character, you could remember it, and also serves a function which means it tastes nice. So, you would be looking at combining the idea of design thinking and lean startup. How can you still have a level of kind of design and thinking about the experience while at the same time making sure that the business idea you're trying to pursue has legs? So, first thing is think big. Yeah? You don't want to think about just a small business that's going to just uh, create pennies for you. You want to think about what kind of big problems can I, uh, can I solve? What kind of big business that I can I uh, deliver that's going to make me financially independent and also healthily deliver value. But big ideas usually take a lot of time, so you've got to start small. What's the smallest thing that you can start off with that's going to get you on the road to your big idea? Um, and it's about, the idea about starting um, 
thinking, uh, starting small, is that you want to make sure that you don't invest too much time and effort into the wrong idea. But at the same time, when you deliver that thing, a lot of people that we talk to, they think, all right, I've got this product or service, and I want to sell it to everyone. And that's where they, they end up being in this situation here, where they've got, they're catering for a lot of people who don't really care about what they do. Yeah? And so what you really want to do is you want to cater for fewer people, but who really love what you do. Yeah? And this is kind of like the power of love index. This graph's a bit misleading. It should be how much you love something and the number of people who love it. But ideally, you want to start off on that right-hand side. Um, so I've got some 10 tips, 10 tips to how we look at creating a minimal lovable product. First thing, um, actually build something that people care about. This actually means something. And what does that mean? It's like, um, a lot of the time, has anybody heard of Simon Sinek? Uh, he, he had this thing, oh, one person, all right, excellent. I have something to talk about. Um, he had this thing called the Golden Circle, and about how people uh, uh, purchase products or services. And the thing most people do is they don't necessarily buy the feature or the function, they buy why you do it. What is the purpose of your product? What is the story behind what you do? The market is um, filled with loads of different other products that do the similar thing, or services that provide a similar value. But the why, the mission that you're on, the story that you tell about what your product's about is what's going to differentiate you. And the vision that you want to create. So this is, this is what you want to build. This is the thing that you want to start, you know, you want to aim towards. And that's going to take a lot of effort. But what you want to do is to make sure that all the little moving parts in between, they work. But at the same time, not in a mechanical way where I test this and test that. You want to get people on, uh, on board with the mission with you. So a tip, we have this thing called, that in the startup world, it's rife with canvases. One page business plans and things and things that you can uh, use to, to generate your business. Our canvas is this, the Happy Startup Canvas, and the key thing that we talk about at the beginning is purpose and vision, values and story. You know, those are the things, those are the things that anchor whatever you do as you're developing your product. Because you're making a thousand decisions a day, and unless you have that anchor, you end up just spinning and pivoting into uh, oblivion. <coughs> Next thing, stay focused. You've got loads of features and things that you want to put into this product or service. And what you really want to do is just one thing well, yeah? There's a, a, a quote that says, if you, um, if you say three things, you say nothing. What you want to do is you want to make your message very focused, very clear. And the same with the product service, what you do and who you're cater for should be very clear, very focused. And so uh, I love these guys, 37 Signals, the book Getting Real. You know, what, are, uh, what people tend to do is like they, they start with the feature set and they just try and extend the, the time they work on this thing so that they can put more stuff into it and more things to make it even more uh, rich in the things that you can do with it. But ultimately, what you do, you have to stick with constraints. And if, um, if you don't have time to, to build that extra feature, just get, cut it. Don't put it in there. Think about what's core, cool, what's important. And part of that is time boxing things. Like I said, getting to market is key. Getting your product, your service, whatever you're doing in front of real people is important. Because until that happens, everything you're doing is a, uh, has a massive risk. And the more time you spend on it, the more waste you're creating. And time boxing is actually harnessing your creativity. It's making use of all, uh, all your creative juices to solve a problem in the most ingenious way possible, rather than just chucking money and time at it. And using constraints as your friend, helping that spur you on to do something different, doing something more efficiently. Key to any business, anything that you're going to hopefully want money for, is solving actual problems that are worth solving, high value problems. And so in this uh, process of designing your business, what you've got to think about is all the kind of problems in the area or the industry or the sector that you're you think exist and which ones are the really important ones, which are the ones that people will pay money to you to solve straight away. Because those are the things that are going to validate whether your business actually has any legs and whether you can actually then take it forward. And if you're not solving the right problems, then basically you're you know, redundant. There's no reason for you to exist, and you might as well just pack up and go. And again, the tip here is trying to use, this is another canvas. It's basically a way of modeling how, uh, what the target audience that you're trying to address, what are their needs, what are their drivers, what jobs they need to get done, 
and then how can you solve those various things? And there's various elements to do with the actual jobs, the actual pains, and the actual things that will enhance their lives as they're going through the, the use of your product or going through the, the journey of, of uh, solving their problem. And gains and gain creators, that's, that's key to the minimum level product. How can you enhance that experience with this first delivery of your product? Surprise and delight. Yeah, you want to make, you don't want it to be functional. You don't want it the boring sponge. You want them to remember what they, uh, what they had, uh, the experience they had. They, you want them to actually get excited about what they're going to do. And so I'm sure you, you guys know about the Kano model. I won't go into that too much. But what you want to do is understand your user. Figure out what drives them, what motivates them, what excites them, and put that into what you're designing in terms of a product. Invest in design. So you need to have good people on board. You can't just try and uh, design a product yourself if you have no experience in it. And we have uh, too many clients who try to think they are designers and give you sketches on uh, Keynote, and it's horrible. And then you have to tell them that they're rubbish and start again. But I think the way to look at these things is well, you want to design for emotion. You want to get people engaged in uh, the way you're solving their problem. And that, in that process, thinking about who are these people, and again, this tip here is about creating these archetypes, understanding their drivers, understanding their context, understanding what they want to gain out of uh, using your product or service, and then using that to then focus how you design uh, and develop your product. Getting them hungry. So here we're talking about actually getting them hooked on what you do, getting them really anticipating uh, using your product. You know, you want cookie monsters banging on your door wanting for that extra cookie. Because most of the time, when you launch something, no one gives a shit. Yeah, you're, you're, you're the only person who thinks this is going to change the world at the beginning. And unless you tell the right story, unless you deliver in the right way, no one's going to really want to talk about you. And you might have a few like your mum, your dad, and your best mates, who really think that you've got the best thing under the sun. But until you start moving to the right and you're trying to get more of an audience, you're trying to get people on board, that's going to be a hard slog unless you deliver the right experience and understand what these people want. And this is an interesting one. Has anybody read this book? Hooked. Hey. OK, this is, if you're develop, building products or building any kind of service, this is a really cool book for, to try and get people to come back to using your product. And this is the whole idea, you get into this hook model where you have a trigger to go, for instance, Amazon is a perfect example of a, of a product that gets you hooked. Because the first thing you think about when you say, oh my god, I've forgotten my daughter's birthday and I need to get a present for tomorrow, is where's the fastest place I can get a present from? Amazon. And that is a trigger, that, an internal trigger that has been created through constant use and exposure to this product. And also driving this idea of, uh, Action, you go to the site, you buy a product, variable reward, you might find something amazing actually because of all these different ads that come on board. And investment, over time you put in your credit card details, you've got the address in there, now it's just one click and you're done. So that's a quick uh, sort of uh, description of what that book is about. I encourage you to read it if you're in interested in building uh, habit forming products. Um, building your tribe, so this is one of the key things and this is about really building that first group of people who really love what you do because they're going to be your marketing budget. They're going to be the people who are going to talk about what you do and spread the word. And if you can grab that first group, that and this is a uh, sort of photo from our uh, summer camp, we had people who came away from this thing just totally elated about the experience. And it's that you can't buy. Yeah? And that's about building the right experience. And you want people who will actually get a tattoo of you or have one of the bands from the summer camp still on your wrist. Um, and people who might even say something like this. It's a bit awkward, but it, it's, if, you, if you can get that kind of response from people, then you have a good chance of actually getting an idea off the ground. And um, one of the guys who gave a talk at the summer camp is, is quite an interesting way of looking at things. Is like, don't be worried that people will be pissed off with you because actually it's uh, exponentially related to the amount of impact you're creating. If you are creating impact, you will piss people off. So it's actually good to piss people off. Um, and that's really having a focused message. It kind of relates to what I talked about before, being very clear about what you stand for. And one of the things we did and some of the uh, sort of startups that we met, you create a manifesto. You define exactly what you believe in, what you stand for, what are the things that you want to change in the world. 
and that way you will find pe people will it will be act as a magnet and you will draw people towards you and they will relate to what you say as long as it's clear enough and it actually isn't something horrible <laughs> um, building in remarkability is this idea that if you build something that people talk about again that's another thing you don't have to spend in terms of marketing budget you want people to actually sort uh, Seth Godin has this idea of being the purple cow. Uh, has anybody heard of this idea of being the purple cow? It's being something completely different to what's out there. So that people, it's that bizarre YouTube video where someone blends iPhones and things like that. It's the viral stuff that you get on, uh, on, the, on the internet that just seems to go around. It's how can you create and harness that kind of behavior by being different? And, and it's about it's showing your personality, again, relating to um, being focused and about uh, explaining what you believe in is creating that uh, that memorable personality, that memorable uh, character, a memorable experience about your product. And if you care about it, and if you show that you care, you will find other people who care too. And that's relating again back to building your tribe. This is an interesting book, Contagious. Anybody heard of this? Man. All right, it's reading this central. Um, this is a great book for, it's, it's one of those silver bullet books, six steps to making your product, uh, your, your idea contagious. But some interesting ideas is the idea, whatever you do, whatever, or the message you have, if it has social currency, if it makes the person who tells the story look good, they're more likely to tell the story. If the thing that you offer is triggered by everyday sort of events, things that you see, for instance, um, Cereals. You know, if, if you have a cereal uh, that you want to promote and every time, every morning, someone has breakfast and the cereal's in there in front of them, that's a trigger. That's something in their environment that will make them think about that particular topic, in this case, cereals. Emotion, if it makes you feel happy, if it actually triggers any kind of emotion, sadness, happiness, that's another thing that people are likely to share. If by using your product or service or you make it public, so, so the example there is Movember. The fact that everyone walks around with a moustache if you didn't have one before is a public display of what you're doing or the, the something you believe in, and that's a, another way of getting ideas to spread. Practical value, people who release ebooks, videos, free tutorials, things that actually uh, help other people, that's likely to spread because people will want to share that. And stories. People don't remember facts and features. They remember narrative. They remember stories. All the things, these urban legends that you hear about, those are the things people hear and remember. The, the bizarre stories about people being drugged and having their kidneys removed and finding themselves... Uh, maybe it's a story that I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, stories that are incredibly colourful, they are the things that... The, these are the things that people remember. So that's another way of actually getting your product or your minimal lovable product um, more known. And finally, you've got to make all of this stuff coherent. It's got to be part of a strategy. One of the problems that a lot of startups do is they, they go around trying lots of different things. They're in a map and they've got all these ideas in their head. It's so creative. I want to try this. I want to try that. And there's a lot of wasted effort because you're really spreading out your energy thin. And none of that, you're pulling, yourselves in different, pulling yourself in different directions. Another very good book, a bit of a harder read. Um, and it's... Well, good strategy, bad strategy, but the, in, so, in essence, the strategy can be boiled down to a good strategy can be boiled down to three things: diagnosis, what is the problem, what am I trying to achieve, what is my vision, a guiding policy. This is essentially a set my values, the things that I will not do or do in uh, trying to deliver this product. So, whether it's your own principles about I will not work after five o'clock, or whether it's to do with I will not work with big corporates or whether it's, I just want to make sure that all my employees are happy, whatever it is, the, the guiding principles, the things that you really believe in that are going to dictate every single decision you, you make, whether it's, who, whether it's who you hire, who you sell to, or who you get investment from. And finally, those guiding policies or those guiding principles will then define which actions you take, which direction you're going to go. There's this book called um, How to Make the Boat Go Faster. Uh, this guy, one of the guys from the... Uh, um, Olympic road team, I think it's 86, I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, they were trying all different uh, ways of enhancing their training. And <coughs> one of the, one principle that they came up with is how does, just a single sentence, was, how will it make the boat go faster? So anytime they made a decision, shall we go to the pub? Will it make the boat go faster? No, you don't go to the pub. Shall we spend another two hours in the gym? Will it make the boat go faster? Yes, we'll stay out two hours in the gym. But having those mantras, those things that will dictate with all the questions people will ask you, which thing you should do. 
And so, um, initially I talked about vision. And whenever you're doing a startup, there's this idea of a pivot. You change direction if you can't hit a roadblock and you, you're trying a new idea and actually it's not working. Pivots are these ideas where you, you actually change your strategy. You change what you do or you change the, the customer, uh, the audience you're trying to tackle. Or you slightly change how you build the product or deliver the product. But the thing that should always remain the same is the vision. The goal that you're trying to achieve. The, that final outcome that you want to deliver to whoever your audience is. And it's kind of be strong on vision but loose on detail. To be able to react so that you make sure that you don't end up building the wrong thing. So in summary, what we talk about with the minimal level of a product is again the following while you're exploring opportunities. You're still searching for the right idea, the right product, how it really works, but you want to also gain a following at the same time. And the four elements, again, are breaking it down. It has to be viable. So in this case, viable does not mean how many people like you on Facebook. It's actually someone who will pay you money for what you do. That's viability, okay? It's a sustainable business model. Delightful. You know, going back to designing for emotion, you've got, to peop you've got to excite people. You've got to make people feel good about using your product. You know, people aren't just mechanoids just trying to get tasks done. They will want to feel good and get some kind of experience, pleasurable experience from using your product as well, whatever that may be. Remarkable is going to help you spread the word. So the whole net promoter score, you want to, you want to make sure everyone is in these top two categories, yeah? Everyone wants to suggest your product or service to, to whoever they know. And tribal. And there it is about finding that small group of people at the beginning who really love what you do. Because they're going to be the people who are going to suggest new ways of doing things. They're going to tell you the awkward truths about actually this isn't working properly, but we'll stick with you once you try, as you try and find that solution. And trying to build that tribe uh, from the beginning is really important to make sure that you're going in the right direction. And it's finding that right balance. You don't want to spend ages trying to design an engineer but you don't want to launch too early and just deliver something that no one values it's, it's understanding where that is and that's a tricky thing and like i said before we see it too many times people launch with these really crappy mvps that no one really cares about but there's a really good business model there but they get disheartened too early because no one really engages with what they built or they're like a year two years in stealth mode trying to really perfect this thing they launch it, people say, oh, that looks really pretty, but there's just no business there. And that's like two years of your time wasted. So it's really being aware of those two sort of uh, ends of the spectrum. Um, shameless plug, we're doing uh, some of these ideas. We're actually uh, we're, we're going through a, a workshop that we're doing on, at Yellow Wave on the beach. And it's combining mindfulness. Uh, and anybody know about mindfulness? Uh, so. It's trying to be aware of how you make decisions and aware of your emotions and trying to release some of that stress to become more creative. But combining that with some of the practical skills we do, and one of the nice things we're doing is vision boarding, which is actually trying to get those crazy ideas in your head onto something visual. That was me, hopefully uh, in time. Thank you. <laughs>